Hey, welcome to Ask a Pastor today. I'm joined by Emily D'Angelo and Josiah Lewenberger, and we're going to talk about an issue that I think we've talked about before on Ask a Pastor, but we haven't devoted a whole episode to it. We're going to talk about the issue of abortion. And I know that this can be uh, troubling personally for some or can be contentious. And so we're going to just try to understand this issue um, as fully as we can in the few minutes that we'll spend together. But before we do that, just uh, just wanted to ask you guys, uh, as you went through kind of the whole season of quarantine, lockdown, and then kind of coming out of it, what foods did you discover or recipes during that time that you might keep moving forward? Oh my gosh. That's wow, a great Kurt. Question. I am stumped. Emily, open us I up. I can I open us up on that because our family dynamic changed in that area because Corey became the shopper for the first time in our almost 30 years of marriage. Wow. And he shops in a different way. I would typically plan our menu for the week and then go shopping. He goes shopping and then we <laughs> eat what he's bought. So we've discovered some new ways of eating and he's a, a, a meat man. So we've had steak more in the last three months than in our whole marriage together. Okay, that's fun. <laughs> so steak will be your Maybe. enduring uh, <laughs> potential find. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. You know, hearing you say that primed my pump. Now I know what to share. Interestingly enough, around Thanksgiving, my wife switched to a plant-based diet. And so I kind of got grandfathered into that. When we're at home, we don't do the meat. So whenever we go out, I'm, I'm looking for the bacon cheeseburgers on the menu and the meat lovers pizzas. That said, I've actually really enjoyed eating plant-based at home. And so when we saw, man, these these prices are skyrocketing on meat and, you know, plants are shutting down. Brittany and I were like, you know what? Our, our tofu and our tempa, the lentils, the black beans, they're not, they're not in a short supply. So we've been good. Now you did ask what I've enjoyed and I haven't found anything to comment on yet in that regard, but I'm feeling great these days. There's Kurt. some great tempeh recipes out there. <laughs> yeah. as, you know, uh, We're making so. barbecue tempeh bowls tonight. So there you go. I'm looking forward to that. Well, Please. our vegetarian is home right now. So we're eating less meat these two weeks. Okay. Nice. All right. Yes. Yeah, Corey has to change his shopping when somebody else comes home for a little bit. So good. So, um, so tell us just a little bit about your own journey with the topic of abortion. Tell us kind of when you first learned about the issue, what you thought then, and maybe any defining parts of your own journey to how you've come to where you are today. Mm. Yeah, I'll open us up. For me, as a follower of Jesus Christ in my college years, that's where I really began to wrestle with understanding on this topic. And as someone who wants to form my own views based on my understanding of scripture, I do hold uh, to this day a firm understanding of Psalm 139's teaching that each and every life is something ordained by God from beginning to end. And so when the psalmist writes about God knitting together, uh, God knitting him together in his mother's womb. That's a beautiful image. And I really believe it's not just poetic language. It's a uh, scriptural reality that is true, that God orda ordains every life from beginning to end. And so I believe that every life is valuable, each and every person made in the image of God, and that God has a plan and a purpose for each and every life. Uh, so I would say in college, that's a, a view that I really solidified in my understanding, and that's been the case ever since. However, I, I do empathize with those who are going through difficult situations that have led them to consider abortion uh, for a very personal reason. Uh, two years ago, my wife and I became pregnant with our first child, and we found out halfway through the pregnancy he had a rare genetic disorder, trisomy 18. And, you know, this was difficult, very, this is very difficult news for us to receive that uh, the life we had hoped for for our son would be very different from what his life would be. We weren't sure if he would be born, but we were told that if he was born, you know, the the best case scenario was a few months or up to a year. Uh, he would he would not be able to have the quality of life that a normal child would have. And so this was really scary news to find out. We actually learned that 93% of parents who have a child with this choose to terminate the pregnancy with an abortion. And so several times throughout our meetings with the doctors, 
they would present us with that as an option all the way up until 24 weeks here in Pennsylvania, that's legal. And so they would present that to us every time that we would meet with them. And as a believer, that was never on the table for us. We couldn't make that choice because we believe that God had a plan and a purpose for our child's life, no matter how long or short it would be. Uh, that said, if someone is not a believer, I, I can understand that they would think, man, I've got to get out of this situation of such intense pain that I am having. And I could see that someone would justify it by saying, what quality of life is this child going to have? And so I can understand why someone who didn't hold a biblical understanding of the value of every life is made in the image of God, intentional with God having a plan and a purpose, um, could make that choice. However, as a believer, I would certainly want to be able to steer them towards a biblical understanding of the value of each and every life. Okay, thanks. Emily, how about you? So for me, I think my journey, um, though I became a believer earlier than this, but starting to think about it was in high school, our senior year, my best friend found herself to be pregnant. And so we walked with her through that and experienced her, her um, dilemma in that. And she chose to have the baby and raise the baby as a single mom. And just watching her um, do that, she was able to do it because of the support of her family and her church. And not every girl in that situation has that kind of support. And so I saw her choosing life and it working for her. And then very soon after that, just a couple years later, when I was married, my very best friend was um, walking through a very different um, situation in which she had um, eliminated, she had had an abortion and she was grieving that. And so the other side of that, a, a fellow Christian was going through just the grief of the loss and then trying to, you know, start her own family and trying to come to terms with that. So while I had not experienced either of those, walking with another woman very closely helped form my own convictions about, um, you know, choosing life and the sanctity of life. I would have chosen the same scripture that Josiah mentioned, Psalm 139, about how I really believe that God is the, the one who starts life and, and creates the, the baby in the womb. But then I would also look to science as well, for my opinion, and that, you know, scientists and geneticists have have proven that life begins at conception when, you know, 23 chromosomes from the man and 23 chromosomes from the woman come together to make fully a 46 chromosomal human being that has the same amount of chromosomes at that moment of conception as they do in adulthood. And so I would um, explore that with someone who was trying to understand. I think a lot of times the question about life and, and in making the decision about abortion is when does life begin? So I think I would get to that part of the conversation with someone um, exploring that, that as question. well as my personal experiences. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For me, I um, was aware of the debate pretty early in life um, being a kid who was raised in the seventies, eighties. Um, that was a big topic in the seventies, uh, early eighties, because it wasn't that far removed from Roe versus Wade. I think a lot of uh, kids today, it's not front of the mind, but uh, at that time, it was certainly uh, talked about in school from a philosophical debating standpoint, which side are you on uh, um, kind of a thing. And so I had formed an opinion that hopefully was based on scripture somewhat and somewhat on on logic and reasoning. But for me, probably when it became most um, alive was when I was in college. I had been adopted as a newborn, a uh, young child, a little more than a newborn, into a family. And I got a call from my birth mom, and I had never really thought through the personal ramifications of it. And I was born just prior to the 73 Roe versus Wade decision. And one of the things she said to me in my first conversation with her was, if abortion had been legal when you were born, I probably would have aborted you. And and for me, it went from being this this, oh, this is a debate to oh my goodness, my life would have been um, wow. taken away mm -hmm. mm. before this even began. And, um, and, and so in a sense, at least for me at that time, it went from even when does life begin, which I think is an important question ethically and logically, but it went to even if life began later, my life would have still been taken away. And I don't you know, think that my life has had some great impact on the world, but it's mattered to 
my wife to my kids to, you know, just, and, and when you look at the, um, you know, number of abortions a year and the number of lives that are erased just from the American um, culture, uh, it's really pretty stunning. Um, and so, so, so generally when Christians talk about this topic, um, you know, the answer is, well, life begins at conception. God is the person who ordains life. Therefore, we should value life. Therefore, you should be pro-life. Um, so let me throw some objections out to that line of thinking and just hear how you would each respond to it. So some people uh, would object by saying, well, even if that's a life, the woman has a life and to see her as little more than a carrier of that fetus um, devalues her life. So why do you prioritize the baby's life over the mother's choice hmm. as you I want you to lead on that one, Emily. Thanks, Josiah. So why would I value the, the baby's life over the mother's life? Is well, the fetus the life over the mother's choice, because then she's just a carrier of this, of this fetus. Right. So I would value both lives. And if I, if I was talking to a woman and in this situation, of course, I would show care and compassion for her. Um, but if I was just talking to the general public, I would try to um, get people to see that, that maybe one mistake doesn't um, necessitate a second mistake, that I think that we live with the choices we make sometimes and any hard, hard thing can be redeemed and, and, and made better. And I think that the choice for life would make that hard situation better. Okay, Josiah, anything to add? Yeah, I think a principle that that sounds possibly insensitive at first, but I do believe is true that oftentimes it's things that we initially believe we don't want for ourselves or are very difficult or different from how we've planned end up actually being things that we can see as uh, something that was a gift to us down the road. And so in seeking you know, to counsel someone who's working through that decision, I would certainly wanna hear them and care for them and enter into the feelings they're experiencing, the, the questions, the concerns on their mind as they navigate that choice. But I would also wanna let them know there are resources available to you to support you in this. You're not going it alone. And I'll bet you that there's a way that this could come to be something you would see as one of the greatest gifts, even though it started from a place of difficulty and confusion and pain. And so I think that sometimes in the church, we can make this a debate to win rather than a person to care for. And so for me in having conversations about abortion, I always need to remember this isn't a hypothetical conversation. There are many people in our community that we would interact with on a, on a weekly basis where this is very real, it's very personal. And so I, I wanna care for people. I wanna be able to have those conversations that are difficult, but also always look for hope and recognizing that God can turn our stories for good even when they're really difficult and painful. Yeah, one of the things that I would say is important, especially in the church is that we're certainly caring for individuals, but that you are out front on the issue because once you're faced with a pregnancy that that you're not certain you want to carry to term, whether it's for health reasons or lifestyle reasons or whatever, um, if you're trying to figure out the moral ramifications of it, then it's really hard to do. And so I would encourage every young person to think through this issue and land their thinking on it before they're in a place of having to make that decision. Because otherwise, um, you know, you do start to say, well, I'm weighing this potential life or life, however you want to define it, versus the freedom of choice or economic well-being or uh, the potential of pain. Um, and, and once you start weighing those things, it's, it's, it's murkier than if you say, um, we've kind of come to this point. Josiah, what would you say to people who say, well, a lot of the pregnancies that are ended are from people who don't want to carry the baby to term. Like, yes, yeah, certainly there's pregnancies that are health related and other things that are terminated. But a lot of times it's somebody who says, look, this just doesn't fit my life. I haven't finished school. I uh, need to do this. Um, and it's because they're unwanted, the kids will end up either in the foster system or in a home with a parent, single parent. And we know the stats on that. And so all of it 
um, might be a greater societal good to um, not have unwanted children being born in such great number in our country. What would you say to, to, to that um, line of thinking? Well, I think the first consideration that I would share is that your child's life might be a burden to you. And I can understand that from a financial perspective. There are some women who become pregnant who would wonder about losing work or their trajectory in terms of education being thrown off or feeling as if they don't have the support in their family life, their personal life to raise a child with the standard that they would hope for their own child moving forward. However, I think that there are a lot of resources available in this day and age for children to be able to find homes with loving families and parents who are eager to welcome a child into their home. And so I think that uh, something that I wanna make very clear is that in the church, we do have an understanding that sex is a gift that God has given for husbands and wives to, to cultivate families, to enjoy oneness and build that in their own relationship as husband and wife. Now, when we see someone take sexuality outside of those bounds, which would be the case in an unplanned pregnancy for someone who is not married, there are some churches who will say, hey, you stepped outside the lines of our own morality for sex. And so we're going to treat you with coldness rather than being in a, in a position to support those individuals and to love them and to care for them. Now, I do think that there's, there's a way in which we need to be clear in communicating our truth about, you know, what sex is and who it is reserved for and the meaning of sex. However, the time to do that is not when someone has, has stepped outside of those boundaries and finds themselves in a desperate place where they're feeling alone and without hope. I think it's the, <clears throat> pardon me, I think it's the obligation of the church to care for people in those situations and to surround them and say, how can we be here for you? How can we support you and even point you towards resources internally and externally to, to care for you and your family that's now beginning? Okay. Emily, anything to add on that? No. No? You said it well. Okay. So what, what would you say to somebody who has gone down the road, had an abortion, and now looks back and says, I'm not sure that that was the best choice I could have made? What, what words would you offer to them, Emily? I would point them to God who understands that regret and remind them that we've all made mistakes in the past, that they're not alone in that, and that we are all in need of forgiveness of the mistakes we've made and the sins that we've committed, and that he's available for that forgiveness and that that comfort and care through that. And I would also um, point them to other people who have had similar um, situations because I have not personally, but I know that there are women in, at Orchard Hill Church that I've talked to who have shared their stories with me. And I would be about connecting those women because they will understand one another. You know, the Bible's clear about when we go through suffering, it is to draw us closer to God, but it's also so that we might help one another. And so I would really just connect those two women to have a conversation and to understand each other, to move toward healing and restoration and... Okay. So, so one of the other objections that people raise is they'll say, well, um, you don't really know when life begins. And I think it begins at birth or at 36 weeks or 24 weeks or wherever. So how would you enter into that conversation about when and where life begins? Let's start with Josiah and then Emily. Yeah, I'll be honest about my own limitations of understanding. I don't believe that my knowledge of the science is, is accurate enough. It's developed enough to make an accurate statement about when exactly I believe life begins. However, my own conviction from scripture is that life begins at conception. And so with my own limited knowledge, I would say that, you know, I don't believe that it's a wise choice for a believer to, you know, make use of a morning after pill or something like that. I believe that after that moment of conception, that the life has begun and that is a human life. If, you know, it would be the will of God for an embryo to be the result of that. And so I would want to protect that life and see the value in it. I would add to that, that a lot of times the question is the viability of the life. 
And I would challenge the person to think about, sure, a a three-week-old baby growing in the womb doesn't seem viable outside of the womb, but a two-month-old baby left on his own is not valuable on his Uh, could not sustain his own life. And I would even argue maybe that some teenagers could not take care of themselves without parental assistance. And so I think that um, that I really believe that a a child at conception is a fully full human and they grow in different places, you know, in the womb for a time and then outside of the womb for a time. But that's where I would go in that conversation. It is interesting how in one wing of a hospital, doctors and parents will fight to keep a baby alive who was born prematurely at 28 weeks, 26 weeks, and throw all their resources at it. And then in some states, uh, abort a baby up to um, almost the full term. Uh, It's ironic how, you know, at times you'll charge somebody with involuntary manslaughter if they get in an accident where they were careless and a pregnant lady loses the pregnancy. Um, and yet the same lady could drive and have the baby aborted. And so as a society, it's like we're, we haven't even answered the question, really. We're, we're trying to have both sides of the equation. And, um, and it is a, a, a tough thing. How we, what would you say to somebody who says, look, I'm not a believer, so I don't acknowledge your God um, at all. I don't really care. Um, about that, but I do want to be a moral person um, in regards to all things. And so how would you advise that person to think about morality when it comes to uh, this issue? I'm reminded of what Ravi Zacharias said to a group one time on that issue. Um, When a plane crash happens and 20 people die and 30 people live, People wonder, you know, how how does God get to arbitrarily decide who lives and who dies? And then some that same person might say, but if I have a baby in my womb, I get to decide if the baby lives or dies. And it it got the person thinking that um, we sometimes play God in our moral decisions that we make. And um for whatever that's worth, I think that's helpful to think through that a little bit, that we um, maybe have a standard for God that is a different standard when we're faced with a life or death situation. Yeah, I think that in our culture today, there is a common acceptance that life matters and lives matter. And we can make specific statements when we see people groups being oppressed or treated unjustly. And so in our culture, it's, it's something that many people this day and age who would say, I'm not religious, would be more than uh, feeling convicted to say black lives matter because I see black people in our country being oppressed and treated with unjust, uh, treated with unjust protocols and treatment. Uh, in a variety of settings. And so I think in a similar way, when we see a group that is being mistreated, oppressed, or life being taken away from them, such as the unborn, there is a need to stand up and say, lives matter. And here's a people group that doesn't have a voice for themselves. And I'm going to stand up and care for those who, who don't have the ability to do so. And so I think that that is an, an argument that is commonly accepted by many who would say, man, I don't know about this whole, every human being is made in the image of God and, you know, knit together in their mother's womb before they're made. But people in our culture, this day and age would say lives matter. And those who can't speak for themselves or who are being treated unjustly, we who do have the ability to speak for them have an obligation to stand up. And so that's how I would approach it. A few years ago, I took uh, one of my sons down to University of Pennsylvania. He was looking at the school and well, he was on his professor tour thing. I went to the bookstore, which is always what I do when I have a few free minutes. And and when I came out, there was a a rally going on and uh, it was a pro-choice rally. And one of the girls came up to me, girls, because I'm old, uh, women came up to me. She was probably 20, early 20, certainly. And uh, she said, would you sign our petition? I said, well, I don't want to sign your petition. I said, "Um, but I'd be happy to take your literature and 
just have you tell me in 90 seconds why you believe this matters. I said, under one condition. I said, I want you to give me the same respect and let me tell you in 90 seconds why it matters to me. And she said, sure. And so she handed me a flyer and she basically went through kind of some of the arguments for women's rights and, you know, why this was so important. And I, I just said, okay, thank you. And I said, you know, I'll consider that. And I said, so I just want you to look at me. And he said, you know, I don't feel like my life's that outstanding. And I told her the story I told earlier about um, getting a call from my birth mom for the first time saying, um, you know, I would have aborted you if you had been born uh, in this time period. And I said, just think about, you know, the millions of lives that are erased by what you're, you're doing. I don't think I changed her mind, but, but, but I think it goes to, we want to dehumanize the idea of a fetus. And, and there's something about seeing faces and names that when we understand that it's human life, even if, it, even if you want to argue that life hasn't begun, it certainly becomes life. And, uh, and, and so you're, you're eliminating people. And so I, it, it's interesting to me that, that the moral argument on this has swung so strongly to choice. And it seems like the moral argument should be on the side of, of the most vulnerable. Um, and I understand, you know, obviously that people see this as a women's right issue. Um, in terms of choice and, and some of those things. And that's why people say that this matters. But half of the babies that are being aborted are women. Um, and so, you know, it's, a, it's just an interesting time for our country in this issue. And hopefully the church can continue to have a voice on it and not be marginalized on this issue or other issues uh, that are substantial like that. So thank you both for uh, joining the conversation today. If you have questions or topics you'd like to see us address, please send them to askapastor at orchardhillchurch.com and we'll be happy to address them uh, in a coming episode.